and welcome to Burdock Group's Ask the Expert. My name is John L. Lagabon. I'm a business development executive at Burdock Group, and I've been moderating today's discussion. As many of you know, Burdock Group is an ingredient safety and regulatory firm, has over 30 years of experience helping innovators overcome the regulatory hurdles in the food, dietary supplement, and animal feed industry. This afternoon's event is a live Q&A where you will get the opportunity to ask questions about a specific topic. Today's topic will be about animal feed ingredient compliance. We've already received a few questions, but if you think of a question during the event, please submit it to the questions tab on the GoToWebinar sidebar, and we will do our best to answer it today. If we run out of time, we will do our best to answer it afterward. As always, if you want to speak with one of our experts about a specific issue, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at info at burdockgroup.com, and we will do our best to get back to you as soon as possible. The gentleman sitting across from me today is a familiar face to many of you. He earned a doctorate in toxicology from Medical College of Virginia within the Virginia Commonwealth System, and has over 15 years of experience advising clients regarding ingredient safety and regulatory affairs. For the second time, I'd like to welcome Burdock Group's Director of Toxicology, Dr. Ray Matulko. Thank you for taking time today to answer some questions. Thank you very much for having me, John L. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I really find this topic very interesting concerning compliance of animal feed ingredients because in many ways it's very similar to uh, compliance for human food ingredients, but in some ways it's critically different. And it's always nice to talk about that. Uh, for most of animal feed ingredients, there are several different pathways in order to reach compliance. Uh, the major pathway is to go through on the federal level, is to go through the uh, food additive petition route mm -hmm. in which um, the regulations state that any ingredient added to animal feed must be a food additive if it has not been uh, concluded as generally recognized as safe or grass. And that is another federal route in which we can take in order to show safety of the ingredient under the intended in conditions of use. Uh, that is very similar to what goes on on the human side. Hmm. However, there is additional route that one can take because the uh, federal route occurred and was uh, uh, came into regulation in 1958. Prior to that point, the individual states all work together to uh, show safety and meet certain standards such that there was standardization of different ingredients through the different states. Mm -hmm. That occurred um, well before uh, the 1958 um, Amendments Act uh, for the federal level. So that is another level that can be utilized to show compliance with safety of feed ingredients. Okay, thank you for the high level overview. And with that, we will launch into our Q&A. All right, the first question, I think is a good place to start for us. Is grass for pets and animals the same as grass for humans? Okay, that is a good question because in many aspects, the grass aspect is the same for humans as well as for animals. And I'm going to expand that not just for pets, but for commercial animals. Mm -hmm. Because there are subtle differences between conducting safety assessments for companion animals versus commercial animals, such as uh, livestock, so to speak. The uh, grass aspect is really the same. You have to meet the same regulatory guidelines and the same a rigor and standards that are necessary for human food ingredients uh, for animal feed ingredients. You have mm -hmm. to show that these ingredients are safe uh, according to a reasonable certainty of no harm. We follow the same standard procedures of looking at the scientific data, of having specifications to show that you can reliably reproduce and produce your product and you show that the product is stable and you have adequately characterized the ingredient. All of these different pieces are very similar and the same as what is needed for a food additive petition. 
However, for RAS, all of the critical information in which you're showing safety has to be in the public venue. Mm -hmm. Meeting that general recognition part. Meeting the general recognition standard. I'd like to follow that up and build on that question. So what are some of the key differences uh, between animal feed and grass and human grass? Okay, for um, animal feed grass versus human grass, one of the, the most significant aspects is for commercial animals, you really have to show not only that the ingredient is safe for that commercial animal mm -hmm. doing target animal safety studies within the, the, that species, because every species can poten potentially react differently and have different changes within uh, you consuming that ingredient. Uh, case in point, uh, chromium can be very toxic to sheep where it is not to other uh, livestock. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful on how much you give them, whereas you're not as concerned with some other species. For uh, comparison with a human grass, not only do you have to worry how much the animals are consuming, but any residues, you have to concern about how many, how much humans are consuming mm -hmm. of the res residual feed ingredient maybe in the tissues that are consumed from those commercial animals. So definitely there's another layer of safety that yeah. you have to be worried about. Or specificity. Yes. Okay. Very good. But in terms of safety, you need to still meet the same threshold of you, safety. You have to meet the same threshold of Understood. reasonable certainty of no harm. And you have to do that both for the animal itself and for the humans consuming those edible tissues. Be it milk, meat, eggs, uh, any combination of those. It's another, it's another layer to, that makes animal feed a lot more complex than human, yes. human grass. Thank you for the explanation. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, these next two questions are, are fairly similar, but they really go into some of the foreign impact or impact of foreign approvals on maybe US regulations, particularly grass. Now, getting to the question, can supporting data from ingredient approvals in countries outside the United States be used to gain approval here in the US? For example, ingredients that are approved in the EU, but not yet approved in the US. Can you elaborate that's, on that? That's a good question. And I get a lot of people that ask, can this, since this is already approved in the EU, can I bring it over here? And many times the answer is, what is the safety data? Mm -hmm. You really can't just rely on uh, uh, approval process in another country and just to shepherd it straight through. FDA and uh, the federal level really wants to do their own assessment and mm -hmm. wants to hear how that ingredient in those safety studies meet FDA's or American threshold of reasonable certainty of no harm. You really have to explain it and show that it does meet the same standard um, as it would uh, for any other ingredient that started in the US and has the same type of uh, evaluation. So, but the safety studies that are done and the studies that were done for the EU uh, submission or approval can be utilized here in the US. If you're going for a grass, then it would have to be publicly acknowledged and in the pub public venue. Mm -hmm. Many times just having that acknowledgement of the EU uh, or EFSA uh, documentation, talking about a safety assessment may not be sufficient mm -hmm. because a lot of the data that was actually generated and evaluated by the EU, European Commission is not or are not in those assessments. And FDA has said, this is great understanding, but we actually need to see those studies mm -hmm. or we need to see more of the data of those studies. So yes, they do help. However, there's caveats in that yeah. how much they can help. But primarily, the, the biggest part of that is if your studies are done well and they're done according to certain standards, we might be able to use the ones that we're using the EU for the grass stuff seen in the United States. Yes, exactly. That's, that's, that's the critical point is that for many of those, those studies and many of the information that's provided, 
the EU standard is very similar. It's mm -hmm. not the same, and they do vary according to different types of ingredients. But in many ways, they, yeah. their standard is similar, and such that we're able to, here in the States, utilize those studies to a, a significant extent if we can have access to that data. So that really cuts down on, on cost and timelines in order to get uh, either a grass or a food added petition done here. Sounds good. Building on that question, this, qu this attendee also has another similar uh, question about other approvals. Mm -hmm. Does the EU approval of an ingredient influence the acceptance of the same in the United States? I think we've kind of addressed that. Mm -hmm. Specifically when it comes to insect-derived protein use in fat food. Okay. Uh, the insect-derived proteins is definitely a growing area here in the States, and we're looking at that more and more. And it's the EU evaluation can also have an impact on how it was evaluated, what were the different uh, components that were evaluated by the EU, by the European Commission, and uh, how the European Commission, you know, responded to that aspect. But yes, the uh, regulations in and of themselves or the approvals, FDA will look at and see what the European Commission evaluated and summarized. Mm -hmm. But overall, FDA and states under AFCO will want to do their own analysis. Okay, but there is an impact. There is the EU impact. has already approved it, but FDA is still looking to make their own analysis. Yes, FDA okay. will want to do their own analysis and make their own assessment. They will not just, you know, uh, stamp something and say, just because another regulatory body approved it, we are going to do the same. They okay. do want to do their own assessment, and we need to do our own assessment if it's a grass process to show that we've done our due diligence in meeting that regulatory standard of reasonable certainty and no harm. Sounds good. Well, this next question has multiple parts, so we're going to break it down into multiple sections. Uh, here we go. What would the status of peptides that arise from the hydrolysis of natural food proteins, like milk proteins, peptides, peptides that might be components of whey protein hydrolysate, or even natural metabolites of milk proteins? So I guess we'll start there. Okay, that sounds good, because that is very unique and uh, I've seen different things coming through in terms of approvals and submissions to kind of weigh and, and have an understanding of what's how I relate to this one, these peptides, because FDA is typical and this is what I have heard from FDA in discussions with them over the last 17 years that, I, that I've been doing this, uh, FDA will look at things that are concentrates of even food products and say, we need to know that you've not concentrated something that in the whole food product mm -hmm. is very minute, but through your manufacturing process, you may have concentrated something that could pose a safety hazard or a safety issue. So even with peptides, FDA and experts in the field are going to say, well, how do we know that you didn't concentrate something along with those peptides mm -hmm. that you didn't mean to, but it came through anyhow, such that you concentrated something that could pose a safety hazard. So unfortunately, you can't just blanket say, well, because it's coming from whey and we consume whey all the time, it's going to be no issue yeah. and, it's, and it's approved. Yeah. I have seen some uh, notified uh, grasses on the human side that were for meat protein isolates. And so we, you know, eat meat, eat, you know, beef and, mm -hmm. and everything, but because they isolated just a significant portion of that product, of that material that we commodity, that was notified and, and concluded this grass. I believe that FDA would be looking at the peptides in the same manner. They would want to know that the has company distinct... has done the due diligence to show safety. Okay. So you didn't really answer this next follow-up portion of this question. Okay. But we're, I think we're on the right track. All right. Uh, can, can these peptides be freely added to pet and animal feed? Are they treated as food? 
or is some form of regulatory filing necessary? So your answer that, that uh, answer to the last question uh -huh. was right around it, but right now we're trying to get into the gray of it exactly. and trying to define a line. Now, what, what are your thoughts on that previous question? My thoughts on, on this question is that I think that you do have to, as a company, do your due diligence and uh, would either have to uh, conduct your own conclusion of grass. Mm -hmm. You may not even have to uh, do any new studies. You may only have to do a literature research review to show your peptides, to show your manufacturing process such that you've not isolated anything else. You've not had a concern that your product would be a, a potential mm -hmm. concern to the consumption by pets or, or other animals. But you do have to do it for the target species. You know, keep in mind a food additive as well as a grass ingredient or an ingredient that is grass, it's grass for its use under its intended conditions. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's the amount of peptides you're providing, what those peptides are, how much you're, you're giving them to the animal, and uh, would that pose a, a concern as they're being digested? Okay. Most likely not, but you have to do your due diligence. Absolutely. But I, I think another clarifying point to that sure. is what what point would you say that it's no longer food common food and it, it actually warrants getting a regulatory assessment or a safety assessment and at what point do we make that determination which i think is a great question because it's i think everyone question. has that question yes. I have that question uh, well many instances i have that question too <laughs> because <laughs> everyone is, has that question yeah there is no fine line okay you, you can't say well you hit 80 percent pure therefore you have to do a grass you can't say, oh, well, it's 95% isolated in peptides alone, so you have to do a, a, a safety assessment. Mm -hmm. There is no fine line. There is no demarcation. You have to look at the data. You have to look and say, all right, how pure have we gotten this? Have we gotten to a point where it's no longer whey? It's just, it's no longer even a whey isolate. It's actual just peptides, and we really begun to make a different ingredient. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really significantly different from what we started to do. That's when you really need to start making your yeah. assessment. Yeah. Some people are in denial if they're like, oh, this is just milk. This is just milk protein. But True. you know, you have to be honest with yourself and to really take a look at what you're characterized, exactly. what greens are characterized like. Thank you for that. I really like that question because it, it's one of those tough ones. You can't just say, oh, yes, it's this. Okay, moving on to the next question, and this is also a very good one, is can a supplement be included in a pet food? There are multiple parts to that. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, keep in mind that FDA has repeatedly stated that there's no such thing as a dietary supplement mm -hmm. in pet foods or for pets. Uh, there are yes. nutritive supplements such that you're providing a nutrient to the animal and it's supplementing the diet for those mm -hmm. animals that need those those nutrients. That is a difference between the human side, which there are dietary supplements of what we understand to be yeah. that may not provide nutritive value. Does that help? Yes, I think, I think that answers the, the first part of that, because okay. I think the answer to can a supplement be included in their pet food is there are multiple parts, ways to answer that. So would you say that when it comes to inclusion in pet food, um, are there ways for supplements, supplements in terms of marketing term for supplements to be included in pet food? No, not, not, not the regulatory term, but you know, a lot of people call these supplements, oh, this is supplementing the diet. Right. But formally and regulatory wise, you can it's not possible, but are there alternatives for inclusion? Well, there are alternatives. And okay. the fact is, yes, if you have a supplement for, for dogs and cats, and it is not meeting uh, or does not have food additive status and is not grass or is not in the AFCO official publication, you can definitely go through one of those processes mm -hmm. to get it. But you can't just say, well, it's a supplement and I've seen it in other ingredients and in other ingredient statements for five years, therefore I'm just going to add it to mine. No, you really have to do your own due diligence and show that it's either grass 
yeah. or submit an APCO definition or go through a food additive petition. So it has to go through that food in order to go into feed, in order yeah. to go into the actual food itself. Um, those are the, the major routes. Mm -hmm. There's some minor routes in terms of utilizing it for veterinary use only, um, but that's a whole nother, nother topic of going into only having veterinarians to prescribe basically a diet for the animal for specific needs. So that's something else beyond what generally is done. Hmm. Okay, let's move on to number eight. If someone produces a compound that is identical to a compound to one that has a grass letter of no objection, in a new way, using a new manufacturing process, does one still apply for grass or petition for an amendment? Did you catch that? Yes, I okay. think I did. And uh, this is again a, a very common question. Yeah. And in the animal, side of things you really have to look to see if you've done your due diligence and if there's a way to do it because certain ingredients have very specified methods on how that product or that ingredient is supposed to be produced so really if you are um, utilizing an ingredient that is already listed and stated within AFCO official publication mm -hmm. or um, for a ingredient that is uh, got a food additive petition process in which that definition specifically states a specific way of manufacturing mm -hmm. then if the way you're manufacturing it is not listed there then you really do need to do an amendment you mm -hmm. really do need to amend either the definition or the, the petition or um, if it's grassed i can't think of any possibly it's been notified to FDA, as you said, mm -hmm. then you have to do your own due diligence showing that your method is substantially similar such that it would show the same uh, safety. Okay. You don't necessarily, well, and this comes back to what the states would accept or not. Yeah. Because in many times, uh, the state regulate, regulators really review and analyze how ingredients are, are produced, what goes on their labels within their state. And if it doesn't meet um, those three processes, then they have questions. So you really have to show that you've done the due diligence mm -hmm. and you've made it. Some states may actually ask for you to notify your graphs, yeah. but I would personally do your own due diligence, conduct your own graphs uh, dossier, complete it, and uh, submit it to the, the AFCO state regulators that you are having questions and see what their thoughts are. Yeah. Because I can't speak for them. I, you know, I can only say what I've seen and the different things that I've noted uh, in talking with state regulators, with talking with FDA and others in the industry. Okay, thank you. If you were a pet food company looking at a new ingredient, how would you evaluate an ingredient that had grass, but not yet AFCO, but was in the AFCO process? How would I evaluate that? I would, I guess, um, I don't quite understand the question. Yeah, I, I get it. Uh, let's try, let's try to reword it. Let's reword it. Let's take a look at it. Sure. We're going to try to answer it. If you are a pet food company looking mm -hmm. at a new ingredient, how would you evaluate an ingredient that had a grass, there, were, there was a grass approval or the mm -hmm. grass notification for it, but not officially an AFCO notification for it, or at least there was no definition. So let's just say there's a grass in the CFR notified, and but there was no AFCO definition, mm -hmm. but they were going to get that AFCO definition. Okay. So what, what are the regulatory hurdles for that? What are, what are your perspective on, I guess, some of the risk or reward of that? Okay, if it has been notified to um, the FDA under the animal food side, then I have received a no objection letter, that is key, then in that way, uh, it will eventually go into the official publication. Okay. There doesn't need to be a definition per se, and it will eventually get there 99.99% of the time. Yeah, because um, if it's on in the... After it's already agreed, 
that they are going to publish you know, grass notifications that have received a no objection letter through the CVM process, then they are going to uh, have those into the um, official publication. Now, if you're talking about a human grass that's been notified. Okay, that's a good point. And has received a no objection letter, and you know that somebody is going through the, the AFCO definition, the AFCO part of things and the CVM part of things will utilize the understanding of that grass done for humans, but that doesn't always relate over to grass for animals. Mm -hmm. Because as I said earlier, it's the target species. Yeah, and what yeah, we consume, use. yeah, what we can consume, some animals can't consume. Mm -hmm. Some animals will, will find to toxic. Mm -hmm. Everybody always uses chocolate and dogs or garlic and that. dogs, <laughs> grapes and dogs, you know. There are certain things that, you know, animals, pets just can't consume that we just have no problem with. We are definitely omnivores. Okay, I think, I think we did our best to answer that question. Thank you. All right, moving on. If there is a product which is already approved as FEMA grass for human consumption as a natural flavor, can the product be marketed as pet flavor? I think this goes kind of building on what you, you just answered. It does. You know, and the aspect of that is you really have to do your due diligence in showing that it's safe, but there are many flavors that are already utilized. And um, when I've talked with uh, FDA, uh, they have indicated that if it's already been uh, grasped by FDA as a flavor, not necessarily FEMA, but if it's been grasped by FDA or is in some sort of known compendium of, you know, and utilized at very low levels, mm -hmm. most flavors are utilized at, you know, less than 100 ppm in many, many instances. They don't go that high. They're very strong in terms mm -hmm. of flavoring. Um, and if it's used consistently with human use for you know, many years, then that may be seen deemed as being okay for animals. For animals. Okay, that's us. Yes. Okay, so if if FDA grasped it, for FDA, yeah, if, yeah, if, yeah. And if it's in a commendium or if it's in uh, something that's been looked at uh, by FDA, then there's the likelihood that FDA would have a, a problem with that. Mm -hmm. There might be a concern. Some of the AFCO state regulators might have questions on that and say, how do you know that this is safe for the animals, mm -hmm. for the animal that you, the species you're trying to you provide it to? And if you give them a safety assessment, if you say, I've done this, that, and the other, and I've analyzed, and it's, it's not a safety concern, there's no reason that it would be at such a low level, the, the regulators may agree with you on that. So say, for flavors yeah. for the animal feed side, there is some a little bit more overlap. There is a little bit more overlap, yes. Okay. But I would not say that it is a, a blanket yeah. step of approval. And it has to, as I said, it's really critical that it's utilized at levels that are utilized in human food as flavors. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have something going, you know, rosemary is a, is a good point. Rosemary is a very well understood flavor at very low levels. But at high levels, you also find that rosemary can be a preservative or have preservative properties. But rosemary is not grass, it's not petitioned and uh, not approved as a preservative, especially at higher levels. So you'd have to do your due diligence. You'd have to do actually a safety study in the target species in order to show that it is safe mm -hmm. for that species. So there is that variation. Yes, if it's been FEMA grass, and if it's used at low levels as a flavor, more than likely it's going to be okay. Um, even though you do need to. Okay. from the previous question because even flavors and if they are not in you know grass for, for human food use or 
grass for other um, via FEMA or starting from scratch. Starting from scratch, then you really do have to do your studies. You have to do evaluate safety from from the word go. You have to have your characterization of your ingredient, how you're using it, uh, stability, your specifications, as well as feeding it to, to target species for a number of weeks or months. So you, even for a flavor, a novel flavor that's never been used before, um, that's what you really need to do. You're treating it almost like a new. It's a new entity. Yes. Okay. That is good to know. All right. Are self-affirmed grass and pet food animal feed effective as food? Or is there any differences between self-affirmed grass and FDA grass? I think when they, when they mean effective, I think what they mean is, is that a viable pathway? Like the self-affirmed versus notified. Uh -huh. Well, um, and this is very interesting because in many cases, as I had said earlier, the AFCO process and the official publication started way before the um, uh, food additives amendment was instituted in 1958. Therefore, the AFCO process has been ongoing producing standards. So those state regulators do have a say and they have um, uh, they want to evaluate the safety and understood that the safety has been evaluated by a regulatory body. So it all depends upon the ingredient itself. If that ingredient is um, pretty well common and you've done your grass, your self grass, you've, you've shown that it is safe through multiple studies and you've gone to the state regulators and stated, I've done this grass, it's, it has not yet been notified, but I've gotten it through a expert panel. All the safety data has been published and we feel that it is safe. The state regulator may say, yes, you've met those standards. Mm -hmm. So in that way, many states may say, OK, we understand you've done your due diligence. You've met that regulatory hurdle. There are other ingredients that may be complex, it may have complex uh, differences between what's going on with some of the aspects of it, such that state regulators will say, this is very, um, this is beyond my understanding of the science of this and of the, the toxicological nature of it, and I don't have that, you, you really should notify it to FDA because Part of the AFCO process is the fact that the safety component of the AFCO definition submission goes to CVM and they look yeah. at the safety and they say whether they believe that uh, they wouldn't object to this type of an ingredient in animal feed or not. So in that way, it does get some regulatory oversight when it's uh, going through yeah. some federal yeah, oversight federal when it goes oversight. through um, the AFCO process. Yeah. But and so that's why you can't just say yes, all self grass uh, dossiers would be fine. It's really dependent upon the ingredient, and it's dependent upon uh, your rigor. You really have to show that you've met that standard of reasonable certainty of no harm, mm -hmm. and be very clear in how you've explained it. Yeah. So it really goes a lot to the persuasive side of. It really does. That's as well. It's not even just what's on paper. It's how you communicate with the state regulator. Right. With well, with everybody, any yeah. state regulator, anybody that you're talking to, you can't just dump a bunch of papers on their desk and say, "This shows that it's safe." You've really got mm -hmm. to do your due diligence and say, "We've done this. This is showing that this is safe. We've thought of this issue, and this issue, we resolved this. It's it's yeah. no longer an issue. It never was." We've gone through and we've shown that it's safe. Um, and then we've got, had a panel of experts show that it is, you know, actually they also agree that they, they are experts in the field of animal feed ingredient safety. And they also agree that we've met that regulatory standard. That really goes a long way in showing to a state regulator, to FDA, to whoever that it's safe for its intended use. I think that's a great description of it. 
Okay, let's see. We have a couple more questions. All right. Here's a pretty long one. We're going to try, try to go through it and try to answer. Once upon a time, amino acid supplementation was considered grass. I like that. I like the way that one started. Okay, yes. Nice story. Uh -huh. Around 1970, they became non grass for humans, but allowable for animals. This regulation alluded to mysterious toxicity studies that are not backed up by current studies. 50 years later, amino acid supplementation is extensively used in livestock. Could this history of livestock grass be relevant in getting the FDA to, to reconsider human grass? <sighs> Don't repeat it. No, I, I okay. think I've got it. I think, I think it was a great, it's a great question. I like it. It's a great question. <laughs> and uh, I think that you know, because the scientific literature has changed, you know, and in terms of evaluation of what's going on in animals, if there's the right data set that is looked at, and I wouldn't say right data set, if you evaluate the totality of data and make the argument in saying understanding of the amino acids for you know, animals has changed in the same manner, um, humans are not that far off some, from some other animals, commercial and otherwise, such that we should reevaluate this issue and make them grass again. Mm -hmm. I think that it would be a viable option, but you can't just say, well, because they're utilized in commercial animals or, or freely, freely fed to commercial animals, it's a carte blanche agreement that it would be okay for humans. You have to reassess why those potential toxicities were brought up in the 70s mm -hmm. and say, again, just like I said before, that's no longer an issue. This new data shows that that was not a concern, or if it was a concern, these amino acids and how they're manufactured, and manufacturing is a big key to this, because the manufacturing may have had uh, an impact on the purity, the cleanliness, and if there was any contaminants brought along with those on, on the nodes, it could produce toxicities. So you really have to evaluate the whole thing and say, Okay, because of these points that were brought up in the 70s, we've addressed X, Y, and Z, therefore we should have these as grass, and here is our conclusion of grass status. Mm -hmm. And see, um, FDA may change their mind on that. Once again, going to the communication part of it, going with the comprehensive, having a strong argument, but also having that ability to convey why you want something the way you're, you're discussing. Correct. Okay, another question. AFCO has been studying, in quotes, insect protein for years. Your previous question related to Europe, but where do we stand in the U.S. with approval of cricket fly larvae protein? There are brands using these proteins already on the market. I guess they're really trying to figure out where we are in terms of approval in the United States for any of these novel Correct. protein sources. Correct. Cricket fly larvae, right? Yeah, cricket slash fly larvae. Uh-huh. I do recall that we were going through in the past AFCO uh, meeting in terms of approval of different larvae. I it's coming can't again. remember specific fly larvae, specific cricket, but we are moving forward with evaluation of those insect protein sources. I think it was soldier fly larvae. There was soldier fly larvae. Yeah. You can't really say that one fly larvae is going to be safe, therefore all fly larvae is going to be safe. It's you just it's not broken apart that way yeah. so simply. So really you can almost amend that ingredient definition oh. for soldier fly larvae, potentially to include other fly larvae. And this is an instance of using the AFCO definition pathway. It You're would be using an AFCO definition as opposed correct. to a grass or maybe correct. Okay. Um, but it will also depend on what your characteristics are, how your manufacturing process differs from the one utilized by soldier fly larvae. Mm -hmm. Again, it is definitely looking at the ingredient as its stirring point, how it's manufactured, and do, do the characteristics of this fly larvae protein, are they similar to the one that's already approved, the soldier yeah. fly larvae? Can you ride on the 
the coattail, so to speak, of that definition and say, this is substantially similar to the one that's there. We've done some work, we've shown, you know, specifications, we've shown stability of the protein, we've shown um, other aspects that it's digested the same way as the soldier fly larvae, things like that. That way you can get it through the process uh, in a much more efficient manner. Yeah. There's that potential. Okay. I think, that, I think that that's question? a good, no, I think it, it was a perfect answer. And I think it really gives kind of a, a space for when an aqua definition would be a really good pathway mm -hmm. to move forward. It's when you're trying to mend something that's already been defined by aqua. Correct. Okay. Next question. Are there any key differences between pet food and animal feed compliance? The key differences between pet food and animal food compliance, there's a couple, and it has to do mostly with the studies that are utilized and the data utilized to show safety. Because as I said earlier, for commercial animals, chickens, pigs, um, milk, cattle for milk or meat, you really have to show not only that the ingredient is safe for the intended use for the animal, but you also have to show safety for the humans consuming those edible tissues. Mm -hmm. For pet food ingredients, ingredients for pet food, you don't have to show that it's safe for humans because in this country, at least, we don't eat <laughs> dog cats or, or horses. So you really don't have to worry about that aspect. So that's okay. one piece. The other piece is that CVM does understand and they acknowledge that uh, for many studies to get those residues or, or to do other types of safety testing, many times uh, you euthanize the animal to look at the tissues to show that the tissues themselves, the organs, do not show toxicity. So in that aspect, CVM totally understands you don't have to do that for companion animals. That is just not... No one wants to do that. It's no not necessary. You do uh, clinical chemistry, hematology, your analysis, uh, you look at vitals, you do things like that. And you have to go to a sufficient time period as well for um, the animal. Uh, in typically, for most ingredients, uh, six months of a study showing safety, daily consumption of the ingredient in the food uh, over a long period of time is sufficient for, for companion animals. Keep in mind that's, you know, that's a long and a large study. But really, there's no regulation as to the exact timeline. However, um, I believe regulations state for a significant portion of the animal's life. Mm -hmm. So in order to show, you know, time over time to see if there's any potential adverse effects show up, Pretty much for companion animals is the minimum is six months. Oh wow! Yes, it's and it, again it's dependent upon the ingredient. If there's other information out there, it's in the published literature or elsewhere substantiating safety, such that you may look at it and say, "Well, we can make a discussion, and we may want to have a pre-meeting with FDA to get their opinion on only doing a one-month study because of all this other information substantiating the safety of." substantially similar products such that we only have to do a shorter term study. That could happen. Many times you should go into FDA and say, we're thinking of doing X, Y, and Z. Therefore, let's understand if there's any questions that, that FDA may have on it. Mm -hmm. So for the commercial animal, a significant portion of the lifetime, if you're talking about a chicken broiler, that's only about 50 days currently. Uh, layers, though, they're much longer because they live longer, two to three years, so you want to go a longer period of time. Also, it depends upon the life stage that you're looking at for companion animals as well as for commercial animals. As I said, it is not only the species under the intended conditions of use. For animal feed ingredients, it's also the life stage. So if you're providing this uh, ingredient to uh, growing and finishing swine, or if you're providing it to sows, you really want to look at um, the safety of the ingredient 
through the parity of the, the cell, through their gestation and through their um, uh, birth of the piglets in the first few days or weeks of the piglet growth to show that overall, if you're going to be giving it to, to sows or to uh, pregnant and lactating animals, that it is safe for those pregnant and lactating animals and the, the offspring that they're you know, providing for. So it is definitely a downstream effect in that, mm -hmm. that aspect. You really have to do the safety for that life stage. With that, I think we're almost out of time and we need to wrap things up. But thank you for the, the, the best consultant standard answer, which is it depends. <laughs> it depends on all these factors and we got Sorry. all the factors, which I think is a good way to end. Now, once again, thank you for your time, Ray. You're, I know you're incredibly busy and I, we really appreciate you answering our questions. I, I know I learned a bunch today. And once again, a big thank you to our audience for all these challenging questions. I know I learned a lot, and I'm sure a lot of the attendees learned a lot, too. Thank you very much, everyone that joined and, us. Yeah, and once again, if we didn't get your question today, we'll do our best to answer it after the event. And if you know you have a question for us about a sensitive topic or a unique situation, we're always available at info at burdockgroup.com, and if you reach out to us that way, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And Finally, before we close, we're pleased to announce another Ask the Expert event happening Thursday, October 29th, and will feature none other than our president, Dr. George Burdock, and we will be discussing medical foods and foods for special dietary use. Once again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your time, everyone, and have a fantastic and safe rest of the day.